talk in the Power for Life, I was thinking about when I first uh, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I was uh, a, a young boy that I was raised in the Sunday God Church, a church that believed that there was speaking in tongues and prophecies and miracles, things of that nature. And I remember uh, going to prayer meetings. We had a prayer meeting last night. Do you guys know that? We do that yeah. once a month, the second Saturday of every month. So join us in that. This is something, again, you want to set aside time to meet with God. But we did that last night, and I remember even as a boy going to these prayer meetings, and uh, Dad would be praying, and Pastor would pray. We'd have different topics that we would have. We'd have healings, and we would see all sorts of crazy things. But I would come all the time, even, even as a young boy. And, and sometimes I was the one playing in the corner. I was the one running around in circles. And other times, though, I was one just sitting there listening to everybody pray. And they'd pray prayers of faith. They would pray in, in tongue. They would pray for healings. And they would pray for all the, And it inspired me, even as a young boy, to say, you know what? I could pray for these things too. And as and the scripture talks about having to have faith like kids, because we know the kids downstairs, they, they, they believe anything. Most of the time. They believe anything. You can tell them, hey, you can jump off of this and you used to live, hey, let's start jumping off of But they didn't have faith. They believe what we would say, right? And so as a little kid, I saw that in operation in my life, and I was like, I can start praying for people who need, need healing. And God started using me to heal it. it my prayers were seeing God was answering my prayers as I prayed for people to, for healing and things of that nature. And, and there was a time that uh, I was with my grandfather. Well, everywhere we moved, uh, we had adopted grandparents. And so I had my uh, Grandpa Bill out in California. And we were driving in a car down Interstate 5 from Oceanside, California, down we're going to San Diego. And he began this discussion with me. And today, during this sermon, I, I want to kind of go through the discussion we had. We're kind of like talking about the bath of the Holy Spirit. But the first thing he did was turn to me and just said, Andrew, do you know anything about the bath of the Holy Spirit? I said, I mean, I've been around a little bit. I, I, at eight years old, in my little trying to articulate what I knew, I said, I knew that it was power. I knew that it, was, uh, that, uh, that it could empower me to be a witness. And for me at that age, anyway, I was like, I want everybody to know Jesus. I don't know if you guys have lost that or if you guys have, but I hope that it, it, that we gain that that the that Jesus is the best thing for everybody around me. Amen. I think that in my little elementary school language, that was what I thought was Jesus is the best thing for everybody around me. I want them to have Jesus. So of course, if this is gonna give me power, I told my grandma, if this is gonna give me power to be a witness, yes, I want this. Uh -huh. And I hope that that's the as we continue in this series, that's the desire, that's yeah. the something that increases inside of me. Like, yeah, I want this. Everything the God gives to us, everything the Holy Spirit brings, is good. He can only bring good things. Mm -hmm. So this being in Scripture, I think it's a good thing. I think it's something we can desire. Amen. And so we begin to walk, that, that day we begin to walk through uh, Scripture and begin to examine, okay, well, what, what does this mean, Andy? They, they, they call me Andy. You guys know family members, they call me Andy a lot. What does this mean, Andy, uh, the, the Baptist Holy Spirit? And we begin to walk through Scripture. So let's turn today a little bit. We're going to journey through Scripture, but we're looking first at Acts chapter 8. I believe Acts chapter 8 is a, a, a great place to, to start in this because... Uh, for us that have said, I put my faith in Jesus, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life, we have received the baptism, we have received the Holy Spirit. And so we're going we're gonna to examine some different things. We, we have the Holy Spirit in us, but there's something, the second part of this, the second thing that happens that God promises for his children. And so let's look in, and I want to examine a little bit, that right before Acts chapter 8, there's a story of a man named Stephen. Anybody know what the Stephen? Stephen was somebody that was following after God. He was serving God and serving the people, and he was seeing God do mighty things and mighty miracles. And then at this point, all of a sudden, there, there was starting to be increased persecution, increased people around him not wanting Jesus, the message of Jesus to go further. And Stephen was one of the people that was targeted, was brought before um, the, the judges and brought before a council, and, and he stood up boldly, just like we, we saw last week, right? Peter all of a sudden boldly stood up amongst a crowd and preached a message that was cutthroat. It was right to the heart and saw many people get saved. Well, now Stephen stands up in the midst of a council, in the midst of people that, that had the authority to, to kill him, to... to excommunicate to, to chop his life and, and apart, and he stands up and again delivers his bold prayer, a bold message, and he was stoned. 
And from that point, all of a sudden, the gospel, the, the Christians begin to spread, and the gospel message begin to spread. And so here in chapter 8, we're seeing as this message of the Jesus goes forward, there's, um, there's people that are getting saved, and, and there's people that are not from the Jewish faith that are getting saved, and all of a sudden, they're having spiritual experiences too. So in Acts chapter 8, verse 14, let's look at that for a second. It says this, when the apostles, sorry, Acts chapter 8, we're in verse 14. The message had now reached Samaria. And so Acts chapter 14 says this, or 8 verse 14 says, When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And so the, the gospel was going forth in the first area uh, away from Jerusalem that the gospel message came to was the area of Samaria. And we know kind of some of our biblical history, some of our uh, New Testament history, we know that, that Samaria was an area that, that was like a mixed breed. And at that time it was a, it was a tough thing. The, the Jewish people didn't really like Samaria. They, they thought they were, they, they were wrong and they, they were evil and God didn't like them. God didn't want anything to do with them. So all of a sudden, this message about Jesus comes to them and they receive it. That's a celebration. There's, a, there's some new believers. So they said, hey, let's send, in, let's send in Peter and John. We're going to, we're going to send them up there, and, and they're going to pray for these. And remember, it says they were new believers. And sometimes people take this experience with the Holy Spirit, and they put it all in, in one category. But today, I really want to emphasize that there's going to be two categories. Because they were new believers, but then let's read what happens here. They were new believers. They had the Holy Spirit. But in verse 15, it says this. When they arrived, let's talk about Peter and John, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John, they placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They had already professed faith in Christ as their Savior. They were already new believers. They had prayed the believers' prayers, maybe like some of you guys have Pray to prayer and said, yeah, I commit my life to Jesus. But yet there was another experience that they need to have. In John chapter 20, we know that the disciples, they, they, the Spirit was breathed on them. They received the Spirit. But then still Jesus said in Acts, hey, wait, there's something more. There's another power. There's another experience that needs to happen. See, John, remember, John also says this, I, water, I baptize you in water, but there's going to become one that comes, and he's going to baptize you in fire. I like that reference this morning from Linda. The second experience that they had after salvation, these new believers here in Samaria. So as we were talking in the car, I was saying, yeah, that is, that is, there is a second thing. There, there is something more that, as in my little elementary school mind, I was saying, there, there was something more that, that God had for me. That I, I begin to say, yeah, yeah, uh, that's, that's why I call him pastor. Yeah, Grandpa, there's something more that, that I want. There's something more that I can that see happening. And you might already be a Christian. You might already call yourself a Christian. You might have already prayed a prayer of salvation. But there's something beyond that that I believe needs to happen, that God wants to happen in your life. There's two experiences. And so let's define them uh, as we go forward today. Uh, so my first point is that the Holy Spirit enters our lives when I experience a salvation. So the Holy Spirit enters my life when I experience salvation. So let's look at a little bit of a, a biblical worldview. I mean, we, have, we all have different worldviews. We come together, we're saying, hey, I, I want Jesus to transform who I am, how I see the world, how I see my life, and how I see those around us. In Ephesians chapter 2, it describes that all of us were born, sorry, all of us were born and we have a, we were dead in our, trans, our transgressions and in our sins. There's a spiritual deadness that we have before we come to Christ. There's a spiritual deadness that all of us have in this room. And if we say all of those who do not belong to Jesus, they all have, there's a spiritual deadness. The Bible describes that every person is born a sinner. We're born with a sin nature, with sin tendencies. And those of you that are parents in the room, something I want to learn, I just kind of observe from afar, kids. You don't have to teach kids how to do wrong. They, you know, they, they just all they get into the trouble, they do their own thing, it, it, it seems to be something that, that's already in them. And that's a, the great part about being able to train them up in the ways of the Lord, right? Amen. But we see this, or they're, they're, uh, we, we see this, this, everybody in the Bible describes Ephesians 2 that we're dead in our transgressions. 
When we try to do things for God, we try to know God, we can't because we're spiritually dead. On our own, we, we can't do it. But we pray and give our lives to Christ, and all of a sudden, something changes. We've, we've all given different testimonies, and we're, we're all getting to know each other's story and how God came in and He transformed things. And, and all of a sudden, people begin to experience more joy. Uh, I remember Dad says when he, when he first came to know Christ, man, the, everything outside was brighter. I mean, for me, when I, when I know that made the decision, my life, my purpose, everything changed. It was made alive inside of me. And the Bible describes this, that Jesus, God in the flesh, went to the cross and he paid a price for your sin and my sin, and he was punished as an innocent and holy individual. He didn't do anything wrong, but he was punished on, on our behalf. He was punished for me, he was punished for you, punished for my neighbor down the, the hall that we just met the other day. He, he was punished for all of those that we might be forgiven. That the sins, the sin nature that we're born with, the sin nature that we tend to live in outside of Christ, and this deadness that we have, he died to give us life. He died that we may have forgiveness. He died so that we would be made clean. And it's through his resurrection, through his raising from the dead, that we have power to live. So we no longer have to be hopeless. Oh, I'm going to deal with this trouble forever. I'm going to have this issue for all my life. No, because Jesus raised from the dead, now we have power to live. When we pray, Jesus, would you come into my life? Jesus, would you be Lord of my life? Jesus, would you forgive me? I put my trust in you. Not only is our slate wiped clean, not only is all of our transgressions, all, all of them wiped clean, not only, not only do we stand before God forgiven and, and as his son and his daughter, but the Holy Spirit now brings life into us. That's why Jesus described, uh, we described last week, Jesus breathed he, into his disciples and there was life. He brings spiritual life into the emptiness, into the death that we have inside of us. See, in, a, in John chapter 3, Jesus was talking with Nicodemus, right? And it says this in John chapter 3, verse 6. It says, flesh gives birth to flesh. But spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. We must be born out of our sin nature, out of our uh, flesh and all of the sinful desires, and born into... The Spirit. We, we get that maybe Christian cliche word, the Christian title, I'm a born again Christian. Have everybody, anybody ever heard that? Yeah. yeah. There's no un, 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 uh, un, blah, 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 I can't even say it. Unborn again Christian. There's no such thing as an unborn again Christian. We're all born again. If we have put our faith in Christ, and we have submitted our life to Him, if we ask Him forgive, we are then born again. We are then made alive. We are then brought to life in our spirit. But to be born again means that we're spiritually made alive. The spirit comes and dwells in us. The empty dead space that was in the side of us is now filled with life by the Holy Spirit. The moment we pray to give our life to Jesus, we submit our life to Him, all of a sudden, wow. Romans 6, Romans 8.16 says this, that the Spirit of God, He testifies that we are God's children. Yes. That moment, the moment we say yes to you, Jesus, forgive us, we submit our life, boom, now the Spirit of God says, you're, my, you're the child of God. Hallelujah. You're the daughter, you're the son. Yeah. That moment that we give our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit, His divine nature comes and He lives inside of us. And He welcomes us into the family. He says, you are now God's child. He gives us the assurance of eternal life. The Spirit of God is lives inside, and He explodes inside of us. And you guys know that moment. He's like, yes, yes, I am. I am made new. And if you haven't had that experience, man, today is a day that you can commit your life to Jesus and say, you know, with all of my life, I want to follow you. I want to be forgiven. I want to belong to your family. And when you do that, same Holy Spirit that, that came inside of all of us, and I can see smiles all across the room this morning, because you know that moment where all of a sudden, boom, it happened. I'm a middle, it exploded. Yes. I belong. He's my father. In John chapter 7, verse 38 and 39, it says this. Whoever believes in me, that's Jesus, as scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the spirit. Yes. Whom those who believed in him were later to receive. 
Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from them. John defines this for us that he meant the Spirit, it's like capital S, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believe Jesus were later to receive. Now this hints a little bit to this outpouring that's going to happen. It hints a little bit, there's a later receiving, there's another thing that's going to happen. What? To those who already believed. Now this hints at this, but it's something that's going to happen, and I believe needs to happen for all of us. The Spirit of God will not enter our life, but when then, but when He does, He will be released through our life. When God and when He enters our life, He enters our lives for a purpose yes. to be released through our lives. There will be like a geyser explosion yes. from that. us to touch the world, to touch the world, to change our family, to change our neighborhood, to change Madison, the environment, to change, it's explode from within us. God wants to use you. Yes. We love this in, in 2 Corinthians when it talks about that, right? That he's reconciling the world to himself and he gives us this message to go and to proclaim to those that he's calling us to himself. God wants to use it. Some of us are like, oh, that sounds burdensome. No, it's a great thing that God has a purpose for our lives. He has a purpose for us to witness for his sake. We have the capacity because the Spirit of God lives in us to do these great things. The Spirit of God Himself lives on the inside of every believer. Can you imagine the capacity that we have? Yeah. God Himself, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of us. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I can't do it. I don't know. I, you don't know who I am. I'm an introvert. I'm, it's hard for me to... The Holy Spirit lives yes. inside of us. We have infinite capacity, the capacity with Passibility. I'm yeah. making up words this morning yeah. with the Holy Spirit. We should be waking up every day excited about how the Holy Spirit might operate through us. Yes. My, my Holy Spirit may just lead me to pray for somebody and they could get healed. The, the Holy Spirit may just lead me to encourage my neighbor and they may step closer to Jesus. Right. The Holy Spirit may just lead me to encourage my child this morning and they may make a step of faith. I just had one of the little uh, kids come up and say, hey, I want to be water baptized. They, the Holy Spirit can lead me to lead others into those experiences with Him. Every morning we have that possibility. I think we undersell that in the church. We understand, understand the fact that the Holy Spirit is inside us. He's with us all the time. So this point number two, though, is this. That the Holy Spirit erupts from my life when I experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit with us. But when we experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit erupts in my life. Amen. You guys don't know. Some of the people that are in and getting a little excited, they, they know this is true. They've experienced it just like myself. I remember when I was a little kid, I, I remember I'm, I'm just journeying. We're talking about all this stuff. I'm just journeying in the car with my grandpa. I was being, I wasn't driving. He was. I'm, and we're just talking. Wow, there's, there's power. There's potential because they have the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus claims this to his disciples. He, he encourages them. He says, man, you've got to wait for this because when you receive it, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on it. That's what it's all about. It will give you the capacity to be my witnesses. Witnesses to the fact that Jesus is alive and that he's still operating in the world. There will be an eruption in her life. There will be a change in her life because now it becomes all about Jesus. It becomes all about teaching Him. It becomes all about receiving from Him. It becomes all about sharing Him. It becomes all about building others up in Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what the Holy Spirit brings to us. If we have a hunger in our life that... Sorry. If we have a hunger in our life for you, have life meant... That means that there's, there's something beyond yourself. And some of us are starting to get that this month. We're like, yeah, there's something beyond just me. There's a purpose beyond my ordinary, everyday life of survival. Just going to work, clocking in and clocking out, coming home, feeding the kids, putting them in the bed, start over again. There's something beyond that. Amen. This topic is very, I believe, very relevant to us yes. in our everyday life. Now the phrase or the word erupts, it's a, it, it, let's think about it for a second. 
And when we're looking about at Greek, and I don't like studying Greek a ton because I think, hey, we all speak English, so we got to learn how to speak English. But that word there in, in, that's used in Acts, that you will receive power, is the word dunamis. It's like dynamite. And anybody ever been around dynamite? Probably not, because you wouldn't be here right now. When dynamite explodes, everything around it changes, right? It is true. When I was, I had an opportunity to go to Nicaragua, and it, well, as in Managua, they have they have volcanoes in Managua. Anybody been around a volcano at all? No. You go around a volcano, and I don't know. And at first, I'm thinking, wow, this is so awesome, the power that, that this volcano has. And, it, and then when it exploded, we could go around the lake. We went to the, the lake, and they had all these different islands in the lake. They all come, they were all formed by the uh, volcano when it exploded, and all of these new islands were formed. It's all the lava comes and it, you know, all that neat stuff. Any scientists that like that kind of stuff? But something that you learn about uh, volcanoes is that there's, there's an amount of pressure, and, and I'm not a scientist this morning, so if I get these, you know, uh, not 100%, you know, you guys got the idea. But the, there's a, there, is, there is an amount of pressure underneath the surface of the earth, specifically around volcanic activity, there's, there's fault cracks and different things like that, so there's a pressure that's coming from within that volcano. But there's also a pressure that's coming from above the volcano, so the volcano itself has pressure. And it's holding down this eruption that's right, and there's time where the earth shifts or something exactly happened, and the pressure that's pushing down becomes less the pressure of the a volcanic eruption than all the lava and all the molten gases and all the things that are underneath it. And when the pressure from within is greater than the pressure from above, all of a sudden we get these great explosions. We, we can see them on YouTube or things of that nature, watch all these lava just and, and all the gases releasing from there. Where the pressure within is greater than the pressure with, that's on the outside. Now, some of us have been putting more pressure down on the Holy Spirit that's within us than allowing Him to release and explode of our lives. And, and this whole series, my prayer, pastor's prayer, is that we begin to be people that don't put the pressure on the Holy Spirit, but allow the Holy Spirit to be erupted out of our lives. Amen. I asked Linda to bring me a Coke. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. What, what happens when you shake up a Coke? It explodes. It explodes. I got, I got a little kid up here. I was, I was thinking about it. I was asking one of the little kids to stay up here because they would have had, had a lot of fun. Maybe parents would have got mad. I would, I would pay for the dry cleaning. <laughs> Right? So, where are we? David did that last week. All over the wooden floor. All over the wooden floor. Right. Everywhere. Everywhere. And the little ants here. After the hand of the last This coke <laughs> contains all that is necessary to explode at this moment. <laughs> I can't even feel it. You ever feel a yeah. coke bottle shaking up? <laughs> Stir it together? I don't know, this is a nice new shirt. I was thinking, Rachel, Rachel said, are you going to open that thing? No. Just open it slowly. Tap on it. And then, just tap on it. You guys are all giving me instructions. How I could, how I could avoid an explosion. Yeah. I, could, I, could preach, I could preach on that. I, just, I won't. I won't. <laughs> but you guys know exactly what will happen, right? Absolutely. We've all done it. Yeah. <laughs> the truth is, we already contain within us everything we need for an eruption. The Holy Spirit is already contained within us. Look at all these gases and all the pressure and all. As soon as that seal breaks. As soon as the pressure that's holding it in becomes less than the pressure that's within, it's going to erupt. In our life, we contain the capacity for the Holy Spirit to explode, for everything around us to change, for God's glory, for His purposes. We just got to understand, we just got to gain, are we willing to release the pressure? To release it? That faith, say, yes, Holy Spirit, whatever you want in my life, no matter, no matter what it may cost, no matter what it may change, God, I know that everything that you do is good. Do it. Yeah, do 
Do it. Do it. Everything around me yeah. will experience it. When the sprite was, then you smell sprite in the air, everything around is sticky, it took a little bit of cleanup, everything around changes. This is where I and Pastor are, are personally, we're hungry. We're hungry for this. Yes. We want this. Yes. And I believe the church, as I hear you guys, and I see your face, and you hear you this morning, you go, yeah, 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 we want this. Yeah. Christianity, we have sometimes put our Christianity into this little box. Or says, I can, I can go to church, I can be a better person, I can be a little bit better than my neighbors, I, I guess I don't do the same things they do, I'm a little bit better, I, stop, I speak a little bit better, my habits are a little bit better than them, and, and I'm okay. But we can't do life, we can't do the spiritual walk, we can't do all that, we can't completely walk into God's purposes without the explosion of the Holy Spirit in our life. Without this eruption, we need it, we need something more. I need something more. You guys know I'll just get what I'll just get out. Yeah, you're married today, and our spouses need us to be full of Holy Spirit. And our children need us to be full, our neighborhoods need us to be full of spirit. Just yesterday, Rachel was at the pool and she got to meet a neighbor down the hall struggling with addiction, and she, she you ever had those moments when people just spit up on you, just tell you their whole life, they're just telling each other their whole lives. And the Holy Spirit was there. Man, we, people need that. There's people struggling in life without Jesus. Man, I need some exposure to me that it gives me a little bit of boldness to just talk to somebody who's laying poolside with me. I need mean, somebody to talk to me a little bit about all these high schoolers I have at work that are just smoking weed and come to, come to work high all the time. There's something they need. I, I got it. God, give me some boldness. So I can, my children, the children that we have in this church, they need the Holy Spirit. They need something in our lives that tells us that all about Jesus, nothing less. That they need us to have a life full of the Spirit. This is a big part of what God wants to do. He calls us there to be an overflow of His presence and His power in our lives. What comes out? What comes out of our lives? We're going to talk about that in a little bit. What, what comes out? But all of it is good. So in Acts chapter 2, we see that on the day of Pentecost, we celebrated that a couple weeks ago, that there was 120 disciples, 120 people that, that followed after Jesus, and they were in the upper room. They had heard all of a sudden a great sound that entered the room, like a violent, a violent blowing wind, and there were balls of fire that came and rest on each one of the people there as a symbol. And if we're in... The, the, if we're talking and you're reading through the book of Acts, you're reading and you're seeing this. You're seeing that in Acts chapter 2, all of a sudden, there came this rushing wind. There came all the fire. And there came speaking in tongues and other languages. So Acts chapter 2, verse 4 says this. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All 220 of them. All of them being in that room. All of them filled with expectation that they were going to receive power. All of a sudden, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let's say that with all of them. Yes. All of them were filled with the Spirit and began to speak in tongues. There was an eruption that came verbally. All of a sudden, their lips began to speak languages that, that weren't their own. They didn't go and study these things. They, they weren't educated people. They, they all of a sudden, by the Spirit and power, began to speak in languages that weren't their own. And people around began to hear. And they said, man... I, I think people drunk, and they said, no, they're singing, they're, I hear them saying prayers and singing praises to God in, in my own language. And Peter stood up, right? All of a sudden, this timid guy who couldn't even say he knew Jesus to a servant girl stands up in front of the crowd and sees 20 to 2,000 people yeah. come to know Christ. Yeah. There was an eruption. There was a change that happened. It's the same thing that happens if, we, if we're looking, we're looking Acts chapter 8, and, and I was examining that. They, Peter and John came, they laid their hand on them, all of a sudden they received the, 
the, the Spirit of God. Then it, the message of the gospel continued to grow and it continued to go and it went to the, the Ephesus and it, in chapter Acts chapter 19, all of a sudden the, the gospel reached the church, the people in Ephesus, and they began to believe uh, on Jesus they, and they received him. And all of a sudden, boom, another eruption happens in Acts chapter 19, verse 6. Paul, again, he's there, he's preaching the gospel, and he places their, his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. Yes. Right. Cornelius his house, Acts chapter 19, Paul's preaching, lays his hands on them, and all of a sudden they begin to speak in tongues, and they begin to prophesy. The Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke just like they did at the beginning. And the same yes is happening over and over again in the book of Acts. And at this point, as we're talking, me and Grandpa were driving down the road and we're talking about all these different instances of stories. And I, you know, I was convinced it's not just something that I experienced at church prayer meetings and I experienced at home at times in prayer. No, I was like, Man, yeah, Grandpa, this is something that I see in the Bible. Oh, it's a, it's a pattern. People desire to, to be close to God. All of a sudden, uh, men of God came, they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit over and over again. Yeah, pa uh, yeah Pastor. Yeah, Grandpa. It, it's in the Bible. And every time in, in Acts, every time it's described that people receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, something came out of them. There was an eruption that came out of them. There was holy speech, there was praise, there was tongues, there was prophecy. It's described over and over again. Every time it was poured out, all of a sudden an eruption happened. Something is released inside of them. I want to give four things what happens when the Holy Spirit, when the Baptist Holy Spirit is poured out in our lives. The first thing is praise. So Acts chapter 2, verse 11, says this. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. In a, in a family of believers where the Holy Spirit is poured out and released, and where the pressure that's, that we're putting down is less than the pressure that the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden, praise erupts in our lives. Yeah. Because the Holy Spirit, remember, when we looked at John chapter 16 and John chapter 15. The Holy Spirit, his whole job is to point to Jesus. Is to tell us of how good he is. To remind us of all the things that he is. And so praise is a natural, uh, maybe natural, a supernatural thing that happens. It erupts from us because all of a sudden now the Holy Spirit is released. And all of a sudden our tongue can't help but praise God. God, you're so good. God, you're so wonderful. And worship changes. The worship atmosphere in our life changes. When we put on music, when we come on Sunday morning, whenever we're in our quiet time, all of a sudden, I can't help but praise God because inside of me, the Spirit of God is saying, yeah, He's good. It's witnessing yes. to me. Yeah, you're wonderful. Yeah, you're awesome. Yes. And our praise changes. Yes, Lord. The Holy Spirit is here on earth and His ability, His purpose, His, his mode of operation is to tell people about Jesus, to point to Jesus. So praise is a natural thing to come forth when we are filled with the Spirit. Sometimes it happens to me. Sometimes you notice I'm up here on the gym day, and, and all of a sudden, uh, they, this singer is singing, and I have to be careful sometimes, because all of a sudden, I'll start singing something that's totally different than what people, you guys notice that sometimes. Like I, you know, I'm, I'm learning to be on a team together while we're up here, but, but sometimes it just, man, you're worthy. Yeah. And it's inside of me, the Spirit of God. He's worried. I can't help but just. Yeah. Some people are getting excited. They're ready for this. Like, yes, Pastor, bring it. Let's get to prayer time. Let's just pray. Let's just do it. <laughs> We're singing last week, too. And, they, and sometimes it doesn't even have to be loud. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, man, does that mean I'm a, I don't like being loud? And you're going to say, oh, i got to be as loud now that I'm going to. No. Because sometimes there's moments where all of a sudden you're just still before the Lord and the Spirit of God is witnessing to you yes. about His greatness. And last week we had a moment of worship like that too. Yes. Richard was leading and talked about the love and that how much we love God. And all of a sudden, all across the room, we begin to say, Yeah, God. Yeah, I love you. I'm loved by you. It changes our worship when we allow the Holy Spirit to be released in our lives. 
type of thing we see very common when the Holy Spirit comes upon people is prophecy. Uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 6, it says this, When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied. In the Old Testament, a lot of times, prophecy was foretelling the future. And there would be great men of God, prophets, that would go before kings, that would go, go before nations, say, and speak a word from God that was, that was something to come. They said, hey, you better turn to God because this is what's coming. This is what's coming in the future. They would even say words about uh, good things, about Jesus coming, and prophesy about the future of those things happening. But prophecy, and I pray, I pray every time I speak on Sunday morning, every time I speak to my spouse, every time I speak to my neighbor, every time I'm <coughs> speaking in my mission or community time, and I pray that all of my speech is prophetic. Yes. Because prophetic speech is speech that comes directly from God. It's speech from God's heart. You may even notice that maybe sometimes you're, you're, you're speaking with your child or speaking with your spouse or, or you're praying for somebody that comes to you with a need and all of a sudden, you, as you're encouraging them, you're saying words and you're noticing, hey, these, these aren't even my words. These are really good. Yeah. These are, this is like spirit inspired. Like you can yeah. feel the witness of the spirit inside of you. You say, wow, and, and you can continue to go. And sometimes I notice that when I'm praying for people. All of a sudden I'm praying for somebody and, and I don't, know why, but this certain topic is coming up, and this certain avenue about their life is coming, and I'm praying for this thing, and then later on, they'll say, Andrew, how did you know that about me? I said, I didn't know any of that about you, but the Spirit of God, he, he prophesied through me. He spoke through me for your specific need. It wasn't me. It was God. It was God's Spirit through me. Prophecy is a common thing that happens. It's an explosion of our spirit, spirit speech. It wasn't my thoughts. I thought, I'm not that good. I tell people, I'm praying. I thought, I'm not that good. But the Spirit of God is good, and He's inside of me, and He wanted to say something directly to you. Amen. And in my marriage, I need Spirit inspired talk. I need some prophetic word. I need what God wants to say to my, to my stuff. I need that. Yeah. My future children, I mean, what God wants to say to them, I need that. I need some prophetic speech in my life. And in the church body, the, the, the Word of God instructs us that we should come, we should come with hymns, with and with prophetic words, with words from God. Last night we were praying, and if, you, if you've never experienced prophetic words, words that you know came from God, I encourage you to come and join us in prayer, or, or get somebody that you know in the church and say, hey, come pray with me. Because last night we were walking around the room ahead of time where we walked around the room and we prayed for the sanctuary. We prayed for everybody that in the seats in the sanctuary. And at the end of that, I, I asked, hey, what did God prompt you to pray? And someone was saying, hey, God prompted me to pray for a broken heart. Someone prompted me to pray for this, and God prompted me to pray for that. And, it, and, and we grow in this. We grow in releasing the things that God prompts us, these prophetic things that God wants to say through us. That's number two. First is praise. Man, it changes the way we praise. It changes the way we worship. Secondly, and man, it brings prophetic words. It brings spirit-empowered yeah. voice. It brings spirit-empowered speech into our lives. The third <clears throat> thing that it brings is a prayer language. Yeah. In Acts chapter 10, verse 46, another time when they, this, the Spirit of God was poured out, it says this, Acts chapter 10, verse 46, For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. This tongues that keeps on coming up. It's, it's a, I was convinced, I'm riding in the car, it's a biblical thing. And maybe it's some of the most, one of the hardest or maybe controversial things in the church. I don't know why. I read the scriptures and it says, prophesy, it says, speak in tongues. I want to speak in tongues. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. Yes. Oh, me. At the time, I had a friend of mine who was a, uh, he frequented a coffee shop, and a couple of different church members of his had gone, gone to this coffee shop a few different times, and they getting to know the baristas and the different people there, and they started talking, one time the church members at the church started talking about speaking in tongues, and they were chatting, and the baristas were picking up on all this conversation, and, and they knew that, and, and the pastor, his name is Pastor Jeff, uh, Jeff, Three foot the cops up. So we came in one morning, 
early morning crowd. I work at right next to Starbucks down there. I know eight o'clock is a busy time. Also, all the lines go. Everybody's getting into work. They got things going on. And so it's kind of one of those moments. And Pastor Jeff walks into this coffee shop, and and he and the barista all of a sudden said, "Hey, Pastor, we got a question for you." You know, so he's thinking, "All right." Gospel moment. I've been coming here. All my work paid off. I won't be able to share the Jesus with you. And then, Pastor, what's speaking in tongues? <laughs> he's like, I don't know. What do I give? I got to give like a whole sermon series on this. You know, right now, I got to give. I, like, I got to give a simple answer to these people. Uh, what God is doing in the speaking in tongues? He said, and so God. And he, he says, I think it was God inspired. Hopefully, it was God inspired. He said, you know what? It's a it's a miracle of speech. It's something God does that changes our language, speaks, uh, speaks in tongues. It's a language miracle. I have another a friend, pastor, who said, hey, he goes, uh, at this time in his life, he wasn't all sure about everything in the book of Acts, but, but he went on a journey, and he was in Argentina preaching. And he walked into an auditorium, and he goes, I don't, I don't know, but something was different when I walked in the auditorium. I, I felt... Jesus with me. I felt the, the presence of God with me. And he went, and he doesn't speak uh, any foreign languages, so he went, he had an interpreter that was with him interpreting all of his messages that week. And, and this particular night, he, he gets up to, to preach, and he begins to preach. But his interpreter sat down. <laughs> and he looked over at the interpreter and said, hey, I can't, I can't do this on my own. I need you to come, and I need you to come and speak, and, 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 and interpret everything. And he said, no, you're doing just fine on your own. <laughs> and, and he had no idea he was speaking. He, in his mind, was speaking in English, but what was coming out of his mouth was a foreign language. Praise God. God ordained speech. Now, why is this necessary? And maybe you're like, I don't know. I don't. I can't understand this. Maybe Andrew, I need a PhD on this. And, and you know what? I think it's necessary because of this, because the Bible teaches that the tongue is something that controls our whole body. And there's something about the faith that we have to speak out the language that God gives us that it allows our whole body to be submitted to what He wants to do in our lives. But we, I, my my old pastor used to say, you need to lay our tongues down at the altar. Say, God, it's yours. I'm willing to speak whatever, and in this moment when the Holy Spirit comes upon us and we begin to speak in other tongues, tongues that we never learned before, but it's prompted in our spirit, all of a sudden now when I go and I go to witness to my friend or when I go to speak the truth, all of a sudden that bolded, it becomes easy for me. There's a power that, man, I know God, when I was speaking in tongues, that was you. So now in this moment, when they're telling me these English words, these words that I know to speak, and I speak them, all of a sudden there's a boldness in my life that I can say these yeah. things. Yeah, that's right. Amen. This boldness isn't something just like crazy. It, no, it's, it's a walk that we have. All of a sudden there's a boldness because then there's something supernatural that happened to me. Now I'm bold because I know it was God that did it, and now yeah. I'm speaking. I know that it's God that did it. It creates boldness in my life. Yeah. Willing to have faith to lay down my tongue for you, God. I'll speak. I'll sound foolish. I'll do whatever you want, God. You want to pray that with me? Let's put our hands. <clears throat> God, I'll do whatever you want. God, we'll receive all that you have. When I'm praying in my spiritual language, sometimes my mind doesn't understand what my tongue is speaking. But in that moment, I can agree with my mind. Uh, uh, many times I'm speaking in tongues, and all of a sudden, the Lord will bring to my mind a person or an individual or a situation or something that He wants me to be praying for. And though I'm speaking in tongues, man, my mind is agreeing with it. And it's like, yeah, God, I pray for that neighbor that we know that is full of addiction and serving other gods. God, I, I agree with that. I agree. And my tongue is speaking in tongues. The Bible teaches that, that the Spirit prays perfect prayers. Amen. And prays and groans. And, man, I want that perfect prayer to be prayed through me. The 
Fourth thing that happens. First thing, praise. Second thing, prophecy. Third thing, a tongue, a language, a prayer language. Fourth thing is power. Power. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus is speaking. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on. There is something greater in our life that God wants to do. There's something greater that God wants to do through us. And when the things erupt, everything around changes. There's power to be bold. There's, there's power to pray. The early churches were, were reading through the book of Acts, asking the Holy Spirit to inspire us because it's full of inspirational moments. When all of a sudden people full of boldness, full of power came out, they began to pray for people. People got healed. They began to pray for their lost loved ones and share the gospel with them. And all of a sudden they received Jesus. And, and all this spread and it spread and it spread. Mm. I want this power. Maybe different. Maybe you've never read any of this before. Maybe this is new to you. Maybe you want to study it. I encourage you, study it out. Study. I got a, I got a friend who, who came on Wednesday night and he said, man, Andrew, I've been studying. I've been like for a few months now just like studying. What is the baptism of the Spirit? What is God? I want this. Man, I encourage you, seek after it. Study it. But right now, I believe God wants to pour out the Spirit. I believe he wants to give us his gift. It says that the, the, God is a good father, that he loves to give the Holy Spirit. He loves to. This morning, I want to invite Brian up to, to, the, to lead us in a bit of a song and worship as we close. We said at the end of our messages this month that we're going to be giving space, we're going to make space, we're going to wait on God for a moment. And I, want to, I want to do that with you. I want to wait on God. I want to ask Him to give me all that He has, to release in me all the pressure that's built up, all the Holy Spirit, all the capacity that I have in the Holy Spirit. I want it to be released in my life. Let's bow our heads this morning.